Hello, Jael. We are here with uh, for the Gender Astrology Show. The sun is opposed Saturn, so I'm wearing my Saturn earrings, and I'm dressed in a very Saturnian way, even though it's the middle of the summer. But um, I can't wait to see what you have on the docket for us. Take it away. Yeah, well, um, I had so much fun talking uh, theory and the birth charts of, of theory things last time. I thought that we would explore another um, sort of canonical postmodern um, gender ideology text, which is um, Whipping Girl by Julia Serrano. And I am going to share my screen because I want to start with a quote from Julia. Okay, so sharing. Now, I'm not familiar with this book, so I, I don't know if you want to tell us a little bit about the book or um, maybe that's what you're sure. doing. Sure. Um, it's okay. Actually, I don't know if I can multitask. Ah, always. Okay. So I'm so sorry about it doing technology. Okay, here we go. Um, okay. So Whipping Girl um, is really, well, actually, this, I was going to do this second, but we can start here. This is a glossary of terms that was introduced by Julia Serrano in the book Whipping Girl. Um, basically, she coined the idea of being cis and cissexism. Um, she coined trans misogyny. Um, or at least, well, no, I think she coined it, but she pop, she's the one who kind of popularized and coined all of these like words that we're using all the time now in trans discourse. Um, like, uh, you know, ideas about cis privilege and even being cis and trans misogyny and, blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. So here's, I just thought I would kind of throw that up there as, um, I guess it's tiny. So I, <laughs> Yay, cis sexism, gender entitlement. So defi define for our audience what does cis mean? I think I, I know what it means, but a lot of people might not know. So I'm like, is it on here? Um cis cissexual is a synonym for being non-transsexual. So um prior to this point, there were men and women, and then there were trans men and women. Um and that was kind of it, but um, she coined this idea of cis, which basically is Latin for, you know, that on the same side as, whereas trans is like going from one side to another side. Hmm. So, oh, interesting. so what's the yeah. CIS? I thought the CIS was actually like an acronym, but is it not? No, it's a prefix. It's a Latin prefix that just means on the same side. It's like, oh, okay. it's a prefix that's the opposite of trans. Oh, it's so. Okay. It doesn't get used very often in other contexts, but there it was a word before. It just never was used as a gender term before. So okay. fascinating. Yeah. I have to think of some words with that prefix. It's like rare you see a prefix you don't know. You know. Totally. So, um, in my in my research for this, I came across this quote um, in a book review about Whipping Girl when it came out, which was a positive review. Um, but I was kind of floored by the ideas in the following quote, because they're all things that I have noticed in, in terms of what's happening inside of trans activism um, currently that I'm not like super into, but um, I didn't realize that these were also like overtly part of the ideology so it says uh okay not only that but the, the uh, okay the often sorry i'm let me let me back up okay i was gonna start in the middle so serrano writes until feminists work to empower femininity and pry it away from the insipid inferior meanings that plague it weakness helpness helplessness fragility passivity frivolity and artificiality, those meanings will continue to haunt every person who is female and or feminine. So the, the first thing about this quote that really floors me is that this is a transgender woman saying that women are the ones who are the source of 
stereotypes about women being insipid, inferior, and da 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 da. Which is honestly like that's a pretty it's a strong claim and it's notable. It it doesn't say that that's what society puts on women. It's saying the reason that feminism is failing is because feminists are not dispatching this stereotype. Mm. She also says um, that basically the feminine femininities of women who are not born female are, are sort of like more precarious and, and sh- not only should be included in feminism, but should be the centerpiece of new feminisms. Um, oh, right. So again, this idea of trans women are experience more misogyny or are the, the, the pinnacle experiencers of misogyny is, is sort of like another kind of undercurrent idea mm. of the current movement. Um, so misogyny then, could be defined as like any hatred of womanness, basically. I mean, I think that originally it meant women as defined by sex, the way that we understood it for a really long time, meaning that you make a certain gamete. Um, that definition is now up for grabs due to this work. So. I can't even really answer that question anymore because it kind of depends on who you ask. Um, But I mean, so in my opinion, I a hundred percent agree with the fact that misogyny as, as a thing is bad and hurts everyone. Like the, 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 the ideas of misogyny are harmful to anyone who could be seen as being feminine or possessing any female qualities. So I'm definitely like on board with that idea. I'm not as on board with the idea that, um, yeah, that, that makes male people the most, uh, biggest victims of misogyny, but that's, you know, my personal feeling about it. Um, so this is saying that, that trans women, you know, male to female trans women, are kind of the that most of the misogyny currently is happening to these people is that kind of what she's saying yeah basically she's saying that um feminism and feminists haven't done the right things to dispel these bad stereotypes of femininity and her book makes the assertion that including trans women will save femininity because trans women care about femininity and want to like rehab it and remake it basically. Whereas feminists have been rejecting femininity. um, So like they're kind of doing something bad or something and that like we need trans women to come in and save women from themselves um, and show us what, you know, so, yes, like recognizing that femininity is constructed and co-inhabited across bodies that are male and female, trans and cis, Serrano calls not just for an inclusive trans feminism, but one that actively embraces femininity rather than leaving the concept stranded as a synonym for weakness, dependence and fear. Serrano's work is important because it brings attention to how feminism has managed to be about women and has worked hard to expose gender hierarchies, but has not done so without reinvesting in femininity. Indeed, many versions of feminism have viewed femininity with suspicion, et cetera, et cetera. So again, Mm. that's sort of just like reiterating my my kind of thing before. Astrology would say that femininity and masculinity are equally important in humanity because the moon, for example, and Venus and all these feminine planets are said to be important for, you know, existence in general. Like we have nocturnal planets and diurnal planets. We have, you know, half of them are kind of feminine planets, half of them are masculine planets, but we see that as that's, that's, necessary in human life to have femininity and masculinity like in in the in the gender and manifesting video that i did with jay-z we were talking about how in manifestation theory you have to have like a a yang or a masculine influence where you go out manifesting but then you also need to have this yin feminine influence where you let the thing come to you and so i think 
astrology, do, do you agree that astrology could be seen as one of the proponents that femininity and masculinity are both powerful and both necessary? Absolutely. I mean, that's part of why I love it so much. And I think that it is such a good tool to use to analyze really theory in general. But this stuff, it's it's so powerful for that because there is this architecture there that honors all of everything that exists in the world, in life, and, and doesn't necessarily create a, a, a hierarchy about any of it. It just says, these things exist. And my view is, if it exists, it evolves to exist. Like, nothing accidentally exists. Like, I, I don't believe in accidents, which is at the core of why I differ from the mainstream trans activism in terms of, of making a push to say that trans people are the same as cis people because I mean, in some ways we're functionally are or whatever, but like we are also fundamentally different. And like, I think that that's a beautiful thing. I mean, again, I know that a lot of people who make the arguments are making it so that they're like, no, go back to your strict gender roles or something. And I, you know, obviously, I mean, hopefully, obviously I'm not saying that. Um, but the thing is, when we have sex specifically, like gender, again, gender is something that sort of archetypically the, the things have been related to sex characteristics. But through the history of time, we can all recognize that even right now on Earth, if you go to a completely different country, there's going to be a different social culture around masculinity and femininity. That is constructed. Gender is a social changeable thing. But the reason that we have sex, biological sex, be the determining factor about what, like who we call um, male and female is because it's actually the, the simplest and most straightforward thing that is universally true from the dawn of humanity until now. And that actually like there's a paradox where people think by adding more complexity and more language and fuzzying up the lines that they're having more freedom but there's there's a there's a paradoxical effect of that it actually reduces your freedom because in the traditional model of sex you're a man or a woman based on whether or not you do little gamete or big gamete like sperm or egg you know like that's it and every other thing that you want to do with your expression is natural and allowed. And you're still that sex because the only thing that care that matters about the sex part is that one part. And then everything else is allowed. But if you erase that and make the argument that sex is unknowable, the fact is people still are going to make some differentiation about what is masculine and feminine because again if we erase the concept of there being any gender at all then that's also like we don't have any language anymore so people will do the language but what ends up happening is this idea that's supposed to be creating freedom from people and freedom from a sex binary actually ties people to socially constructed ideas of what sex is that actually retroactively dictates behavior and levels of masculinity and levels of femininity onto a sexed body because you can't there's no other thing to go on does that make sense what i'm saying yeah well yeah and i'm trying to just relate it back to like astrology a little bit and as much as like it makes this is the, back to what serrano is this is serrano we're reading right um yeah well, okay, so it makes me think of like a, a like I, I like I like this conversation about how like feminine feminism is kind of looked at like femaleness as not wrong, but like saying like okay, it's we are as strong as men, as strong as men. Like so, keep going towards strength, strength, strength. It makes me think of planetary strength of like how people always think a strong planet is better, and I'm like, well actually a strong planet can be very detrimental to human life you know just like a right. you know a strong male or a strong female or you know can be detrimental to a human life in as much as maybe they're abusive or maybe they're um you, you know so it's like I, I like the idea of honoring like not weakness but like like strength and 
the not not needing of strength like as both like both valid um it, well it's like, like pluto and scorpio right like that's like a strong energy but it's not like an outward energy it's like a magnetic deep like inward pulling energy uh-huh interesting well yeah i'm thinking of like a weak mars like you know a mars and taurus it's like is that more feminine yeah i guess, I guess so and it has its strength like mars and taurus might not fight you or like cause a fight right and its strength that could be seen as a strength of of, mm-hmm. of mars and taurus is that it's not going to cause a fight right and that would be strength in femininity or strength in you know like a so so i, I don't know i guess I, I don't mean to i'm kind of like derailing what you were just talking back and going back to Serrano, no. but I keep thinking no, perfect. It's like like yeah like there's there could be a feminism that looks at both as equally valid and if if you choose to be female whether you're xx or xy that is a strength choice versus like a weakness choice kind of thing you know same with yeah i planets. totally i strongly agree i mean and you know 100 years ago or something original sort of like or or earlier i mean there's been various feminist movements probably throughout all of time but um in more recent history you know it stemmed from women wanting to not be like property of men and have zero freedom at all and not be allowed to have a bank account and get like assaulted and have no recourse and you know um it was it was originally this idea to break free and that was couched in what was true at the time which is this like ubiquitous mandate for female people to be the property of men to bear children to do the domestic work and be trapped in that so you know there there started like when we're talking like simone de Beauvoir second sex era the criticisms were were criticizing that narrow view of what femininity could be but the postmodernists sort of like took that in a different direction by saying, um, like, by, I don't know, it's kind of like a hard left, actually, from from just saying, like, I don't want to be, like, oppressed and I want freedom, to being, like, uh, it, which and, like, challenging the specific circumstance and role that, that is causing that for you, to going another step further to being, like, oh, they're all, no one knows anything, and everything's just, who knows, and what we can't know anything at all, everything is socially constructed, da, da, da. Um, and that's sort of where we get this kind of idea, where we have somebody who is an assigned male person at birth saying, uh, the problem with feminism is that we're not considering gender non-conforming feminine men, i.e. trans women, as women and that if we did feminism would be saved it makes me think of like in astrology how there's like a, a camp of people who like are like mars and aries is strong mars and taurus is weak and then that's like they're always like strong or weak strong or weak and then there's like the psychological astro- astrologers who are like every mars and every sign could be seen as strong and like and like there's there is no strength and weakness and like there's like the, this like kind of like liberal like we get back to that liberalism versus traditionalism in yeah in, in in planetary strength like because i feel like what you and i keep coming across is binaries like a planet is strong or weak a person is male or female and then liberalisms within the binary which kind of weaken the binary like if you say like any mars is strong then you could say like there is no planetary strength or weakness you know it's like it's like does this liberalism like eat away at this like binary strength kind of issue and it's like same with gender it's like um Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm learning a lot from the show of just about like different ways of thinking about the same thing of like, do we take this kind of simple approach or this more multi, you know, valent approach or, you know. Yeah. And and, and I love what you're saying about that, too, because a part a, a really a core part of my work in general is really attacking this idea that you must choose liberalism or conservatism. To me, that's black and white seesaw thinking that that if you go too far in either direction, harm gets caused. And I think that's what is happening right now, because on the right, I mean, people are anti-trans in a way that's like very scary in a lot of ways. And then on the left, 
everyone feels like in order to push back against that, they have to just sort of like throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, and just be like, well, nothing means anything. Um, and so, you know, what, what I'm attempting to sort of uh, assert or propose is that goes back to that metamodernist philosophical perspective, which is it's not weak or strong. It's it it has a quality that could be referred to as weak or strong if you understand what that means contextually. But what what's important is there are contexts, teleology, where a weak Mars is the right Mars for that context. So oh, yeah, it's no yeah. good or bad. It's not about it being good or bad if it's strong or weak or or whatever, or prominent or not prominent. It just is a quality. And my big thesis is that our lives are about a quest for self-exploration so that we can be aligned with our most truest truth. You know, it's it's about accepting the truth that is, you know. Yeah, so so if I love that you bring up teleology here, which is development theory, and it's like looking at like where we do this with charts, where we put them in the right context. Like you know, if you put an Aries in a context where an Aries would thrive, then that person's thriving. If you put an Aries maybe in a like a peaceful, you know, situation where they're not supposed to be feisty or something, then they look disordered or whatever. Like, could there be a, a society or a life where, no matter what your gender expression is? we can find an appropriate context for you. And in that case, you are no longer disordered in any fashion. I mean, there must be a way. I, I agree. And again, this is why, like, you know, I, I'm not against trans people. Again, like, I'm not against trans people. And making this critique, even though I know that there are going to be people who feel like I am just by saying this, but... um the, my, the critique is is a bid for loving us as we are and changing society so that we love and know and accept people as they are and create space for people to be them their best selves and to express their true selves in a way like, yeah, that that's like context appropriate. And I think the, the big critique that I have about what's currently being talked about from this sort of postmodern idea is that I'm not seeing any evidence that getting rid of the language of a gender binary or understanding as, or as, as sex as a binary, I don't see any evidence for that making anyone more safe. And it does cause a lot of problems. Yeah. Do you, so, so, so as a, as a trans person, and I can say that because you've talked about that. Oh yeah. On the show. Definitely. So as a trans person, are there contexts where you feel ultimately safe and awesome as yourself? And, and then are there places where you just feel totally in danger and what are those? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, what are they? Um, I mean, I guess like these days, I don't know if I put myself in a whole lot of contexts that are that feel dangerous, um, but I've definitely felt unsafe at work a lot in my life. Um, I've had a lot of jobs where people very openly said scary things to me, um, although that had something to do with being trans and gender nonconforming, but also is just like a normal part of being a discernible female. Um, I think most people who are female know that it doesn't really matter what you look like, what you're wearing, how you're acting or anything. If, if there are, are dudes on the street who can tell that you're female, they're going to, they, they will say some shit to you, you know? Um, Cause I mean, I don't know. I, back when I lived in Portland, I'd be walking around with my cuffed white tee and my Levi's and my uh, chest strap down and my buzz cut. And dudes would drive by in cars and say like show me them titties and stuff and i'm just like what <laughs> wow um, so I, I mean there's because that's the thing we like the reality is that human beings are actually really good at clocking sex like it's it's a deeply innate thing that we've evolved to be able to do wow. um so which is again this is why this like 
dare I say, but yes, authoritarian flavored activism has happened around kind of like, I mean, it's really kind of a gaslighty movement and uh, that gets overused now, but I do mean that. I do mean that. And, um, you know, we've seen it in the charts with the Uranus Neptune thing. It's, it's about this sort of like, you don't see what you see, you don't hear what you hear, you know, um, and, and like, let's create this sort of illusion or this fantasy and buy into it and then make everybody else buy into it um, as a way to like say that this is what freedom and safety is for trans people. But I just I think that that's just like a house of cards and it's dangerous and it and it creates a condition where a lot of people who otherwise would not care about what trans people are doing do care because all of a sudden now they're like, wait, what? A grown man is going to be in the changing room with my nine year old daughter. Mm, yeah, like yeah, totally. people are mad about that. People are going to push back about that. People are going to be upset about um, rapists who are male being put in prison with female people. And when I say this, I'm not saying that trans women are these people or are bad, but it's just a statistically easily provable reality that male people, biologically male people of any gender identity on the whole create like 10 times more violence <laughs> And, and crime doing then yeah female ex, people so ex, like they're just people have like reasons for that 30 percent more testosterone in the system than like xx chromosomally and exactly I think, you know you, and you lay the chart on top of that and you will see that you know like a the most masculine male chart is going to be more masculine than a, the most masculine xx chart probably right you know right yeah. um no, do you think, okay, this is an aside, but do you think there are charts that are inherently creepy? Like, because it, it, it's a, 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 there could be a, a trans woman in a changing room with a nine-year-old daughter or kid that's not creepy. Like, oh, and, totally. And the, but then there could be one that is creepy, right? And the, is that in the chart? And if so, how? Um, I mean, so... I've actually like been trans wanting to cis do doesn't preclude creepiness. Like you can be creepy and trans right. or creepy and cis, you know? A hundred percent. Which is why like we need to be able to talk about the fact that there are people who are male who will claim a trans identity for a variety of reasons who might be total creeps, but that doesn't mean the other thing is true either. Like I, I don't mean and I don't think, and it has not been my experience that all trans women are bad. Trans women are people, and some amount of people from every group are bad, <laughs> or are, I'm yeah. not bad, but you know what I mean, are creepy. Yes, there's creepiness. Um, one of the things that we can explore at some point is, it's just very complex, but um, is that there are a lot of different roads to becoming trans. Um, like, I think I've touched on this before, but sort of like back in the day, you were sort of either trans in the way that um, like you were extremely gender nonconforming and had the, the most gender qualities of the opposite of the, of the sex stereotype that you were born as. And so you wanted to transition because you would be, I guess they would call it a binary trans person. And you wanted to just be like, well, I'm, I'm most of the way there. And then living in this like this way that's like in, like I would just came out gender nonconforming and I mean for me and I a lot of the people I know people were telling me that I was a dyke before I even knew what that was you know like mm. again like humans are really good at clocking these things yeah so that that's sort of one and, it, and it's in the typology which that's a controversial thing too but is uh it would be sort of like the homosexual type now, with trans women and trans men, there's also, and, and this has always existed, but because we moved into this trans umbrella idea, this following group of people that I'm about to talk about now outnumbers what we classically think of as, as trans people being the like gay, gender nonconforming person um, by like a huge factor. Like 
10 times, maybe more. Um, and that is people who are like, basically have, have various different things. Like there's a metasexuality and autosexuality. So like, um, meaning like you're attracted to yourself or you're attracted to your, your, an idea of yourself as a different gender. Um, or like, like you're attracted to yourself as a, like, if you're a male person, you're attracted to yourself as a woman. Um, and you want to like your partnership experiences for that type of person are really just about getting to be a woman with another person, but it's like not as much about the other person. Um, but I mean, I guess my, my point is that that's a whole other thing. There are so many, so many different roads now to being trans, especially because on top of those things, which have existed for a long time, there's also now the political road to being trans, which is, is just the idea that, um, you agree with postmodern gender theory and you reject having a gender or having a sex characterization at all and regard all gender and sex as sort of just like a mental construction and it's sort of just about aesthetics and and that kind of group of people is more of a like subculture um in and astrology can handle the myriad of trans expressions that exist. Like, for exactly. example, like exactly. if somebody's a trans person with an Aquarius moon, it makes me think of Rocco. I don't know if you know DJ Catastrophe, but like, oh, of course, yeah. Like I knew I knew Rocco back in the day, and I think I think he's a Libra with a moon in Aquarius, and it's like okay, so like a moon in Aquarius would be like hyper political, corralling the whole group, like working for the 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 you know, like the group of trans men that exist, and um. You know, like, see how that moon in Aquarius is like a, kind of a political rallying moon, right? Whereas we have some um, trans people who are, and, and like, I'm only bringing up a few examples because there's like endless examples of how yeah. each trans person is their own person and, and has their own chart, right? So like yeah. then trans charts that are really focused on genitals. Now, th this is going to, like, I remember seeing, um, meeting somebody who was, had like four or five planets in Scorpio and had a transit going over those Scorpio planets and was really focused on bottom surgery, right? And right, they were really right. focused on getting their their structure right in that fashion or whatever. Then there's trans people who don't care about bottom surgery and they're more into the politics of the whole thing. And like, so it's like, I think, you know, it's like some people, some trans people are really into surgery in general. Like they're really into plastic surgery and they're kind of more right. body modification trans people. And, exactly. you know, and they do all the surgeries and all the things. And then there's non-surgical trans people who's like, charts are like more hippy dippy and kind of just like, I'm just a, I'm 13 genders. And I'm, and that maybe we might see like a, a I, I remember um, a sun in Pisces square Uranus and Sag trans person who was, mm. was super, um, kind of multi-gendered with like with like would always wear like all these like patterns and donuts and like weird like it was a very piscean explosion trans person where it's like it's just yeah. like in the gay pride parade where there's like rainbows everywhere and like so then we get like the rainbow warrior trans person like but you see how i'm i keep talking about all these different examples well the astrologer's job is to say like here's your experience of transness and here's your chart which you know is political in this way is kind of medically in this way like like and we speak back to them about who they are on a soul census machine and like you know this is maybe why your transness is expressing in these ways because like maybe you're kind of medical in general like you're also have a cochlear implant and you're like you, you know like like i think yeah. i mean i guess what is the role of the astrologer there in interfacing with a person's transness like what what would you do as yeah. a when meeting a trans person yeah i mean great question um so this is like why a really exciting part of my work and we've been building on this through through these episodes right and we've been talking about these little pieces like early on when we were looking at the different gender flavors of the planets and stuff and these are all little parts that we can put together to make these unique pictures because again i just want to be clear i'm not saying that anybody's transness or gender expression is wrong even people who have fetishes 
people have fetishes. Like, that's fine. Yeah. Like, it's okay. You know, like, these things are fine to, to have. And I'm more curious about what you're saying about exploring the details of what those are. And uh, one method that I, I don't know, I mean, I think maybe the maybe it's laborious, so people don't do it, but there's a method called persona charts that I absolutely love for, well, really for anything, but it's really good for exploring this am I trans question because am I trans is not a yes or no question. Like we've been talking about, it's like how. And, oh, you know, I mean, again, for me, I would like to get away from this. It's, I mean, ironically, like this whole idea of destroying the gender binary and trans is everything has just created a new binary, which is like, you either opt in to being trans or you don't. And then people are, you know, also side note, kind of attaching morality to that, like, oh, you're cis because it's a choice. So now we can judge people for their choice. Um, so what is a persona chart? What's a persona chart? So, okay. Um, a persona chart is, let's see. Um, so let's, we're going to look at this one. And so basically the sun that's up here at the top I wish I, I need to cursor. Sorry. Oops. Oh boy. Oh boy. Okay. So, okay. So, um, what happens in a persona chart is we start with the sun and this is the birth date, quote, quote, unquote, of the book, right? That okay. where these ideas came from and you, and you can do this in your own chart, of course. And then a persona chart is for every planet and you could do this really with any point, but for every planet in the chart, you make a new chart for when the sun has reached the point where that planet was. So like um, in, in this chart, the moon is, you know, right here at the end of Aries. So then we're going to go over here. This is, this is a, you know, overview of all the persona charts. We have moon Aries. Okay. So then the date for that is April 13. And then here's the moon chart where now the sun is at the place where the moon was, but the moon will be somewhere else. I mean, and that'll be true of anything except for the outer planets typically don't move that much. Um, so they're going to be closer. But what's so incredibly powerful about this is that it perfectly dovetails with some of the most powerful uh, ideas that we have in psychology right now, which is internal family systems and like early development theory. So, um, and you'll dig this because I know you, you're into that, but like um, when you can also sort of look at when you're looking at the, the main chart, I mean, this is a personal chart, but if you're looking at the main chart, the order in which the sun hits the planets also has a meaning. For example, in my chart, the first planet that is illuminated by the sun and then that persona becomes like comes online so to speak is mercury retrograde and we all know i love to talk okay yeah. um and blah 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 and research it's good that you you're know, on a talk is... it's good that you're on a talk show I know, it's, not thank a, it's not a listening show it's a talk show right <laughs> thank you yes uh yeah so i got mercury retrograde with Saturn and Pluto in the eighth house and Scorpio, you know, so it's like, yeah, okay, I love to do deep research, you know, and that's also my first go to, you know. Interestingly, also on my chart, my Venus is right behind my sun, so it's the farthest and last part of my chart to come online. And in my Venus persona chart, it's all ganged up on in the 12th house. Hmm. So that's interesting. So the different charts have. Um, like, so it's like in IFS that, or internal family systems, there's sort of ideas like there's your protector part and maybe your inner child part and maybe your rebel partner. I mean, they have some ones they came up with, but really, you know, you can identify your own ones, but that maps really well onto things like, you know, your moon persona chart is going to talk about moon things you know your inner child the mother and mothering your emotionality you know who you are privately like that like that kind of stuff it can also really talk about like it's a great chart to to see how you are with people that you're comfortable with you know um and then that's 
you know, you, again, you can go through all of them, like Mercury, your intellect, how you communicate. If you want to explore your communication more, you can pull up your Mercury persona chart. And they, and they create these distinct sort of persons within yourself that is a person, because in reality, you know, typically only people who are diagnosed with uh, dissociative, dis di dissociative identity disorder or schizophrenia or something like that, are really the only people who get recognized as having like multiple parts in this way, but really the psyche is always multiple parts. And by exploring these charts, you can see what parts of yourself you are, like some parts you'll pull up a chart and you'll be like, oh my God, I totally resonate with this. I do this, I'm conscious of this. But the really juicy part is getting into the things where, you know, that you are more unconscious about and the planet that rules your ascendant is typically a really good place to start, which is why for this book I did Moon, because that rules the ascendant of the um, book's chart. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, it's the moon. So, of course, like, there's no sun persona chart because that's your birth chart. <laughs> um, oh, interesting. And I will also say for charts like the book that don't, um, or I should say, Julia's but if you don't have a birth time this is an amazing tool because the moon in a day as you know will have some variations so that's a little you know fuzzy but the sun and pretty much all of the other planets are not going to be moving so much that you're going to have a completely different chart so you can actually really, you can get a chart that has angles and houses laid out that will be accurate, um, even if the main chart doesn't have that information. So that's also like a really powerful way to use this. So talk about, okay, traditionalism and like binaryism versus like liberalism. So as, as far as we're constructing new charts for a person, I am a total traditional, like, in, as a teleologist, we, at least I, never construct a new chart for a person, whether it be a relocation chart, um, even a solar return I don't do because I'm like, oh, so you made a new chart for the year that takes away from the involvement of your birth chart, which, um, so it's, it's just funny, like, like I'm like more horrified than I could ever be when I hear people make new birth charts for people. I'm just like, oh, you're taking away from the birth chart of the, that is like, because as a teleologist, we we basically work with a person to uh, grow their birth chart to the maximal level. We, yeah. if you t make a new chart with a new ascendant, you basically have taken away from the life path and purpose. Like, but isn't that funny? Well, okay, but that's not that's not how this works. Mm -hmm. You should definitely not can you should not look at it as the new birth chart. Okay. First of all, what it actually is is a series of transit charts. Okay. Because these are not like fictional charts. They are the date after you were born that the sun reached a certain point in your natal chart. So, I mean, that felt too complex to get into today because we're just kind of introducing this idea. But like, you're going to read the chart in a specific way as a way to understand a certain point in your natal chart but it is a transit chart mm. and its relationship to the natal part chart is also important, but it is not a new birth chart. Okay. It's just, it's sort of, it's, it's actually, I mean, it's kind of a different way of like, sort of like doing harmonics or something, um, which I think can also be really useful. You're, you're taking the core natal data and, and sort of like doing a microscope, but, nothing replaces the natal chart i, I agree yeah and it's, and it's fine for us to have different astrologies just like it's, it's fine for us to have different genders and different gender ideologies that like as we've seen as on, on a discourse level there is never one um you know it's like but in the in the the pool of astrology professors out there it's like i'm just like this kind of like weirdly traditional person about like you know but but yeah like i, I i'm open to hearing all the techniques that you have I just was, you know, telling you that, like, I'm this kind of, like, weirdly... Oh, yeah. Strict. Totally. I don't even, like... Yeah. 
lay different. You brought up a good point, though. So I'm glad I got even to say that because I I don't I don't want to present this as a new natal chart. It doesn't trump your natal chart. It's just a way of. It's sort of like um, you have your natal chart, and you might like look at the chart for the day that your dad went out for cigarettes and never came back. <laughs> um, you know, like <laughs> like that might be that might affect you and like understanding the transit energy of that time may help you more deeply understand something about yourself. And I, and I think that's what I like about this technique is that it's, it's, it just, it, it kind of brings um, certain things very kind of quickly to the eye. Um, you don't even you don't read a persona chart necessarily exactly like you would read an natal chart. For example, in the persona charts, what's on the ascendant um, represents what that planet in your chart has that it is unconscious about, and what it is trying to sort of like realize or bring to life in 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 you know in the course of your life and then the the mid heaven actually represents sort of like how that is coming down to earth and expressing in you know tangible material form so that's like more narrow you know than the other things and also again it's not broad it's like my mars has an ego that is flavored like this sun my mars has an a way of thinking that is like this mercury do you, do you know what i'm saying yeah yeah you know what i just had a thought of this is a non sequitur but um yeah we're talking about like i think it was judith butler last week who, where i think she's the one who said that genders are performance is that true yeah yeah okay like made me think of the performativity of the chart like what if we're like the chart is a performance like so it's like 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 i'm performing my like I identify as a Scorpio on a Libra, even though I'm a 2947 Libra, but I have Mercury and Scorpio on the sun. So, and it's ruling my chart because I'm Gemini rising. But like, I always like play, I always perform Scorpio, see how I'm all black and like I'm wearing way too much black for the summer right now. And it's like, I'm performing <laughs> Scorpio right now. But like, yeah. I, I think we could spend some more time on like, the performativity of gender or the performativity of astrology is like, I think, you know, even astrologers, once we know our transits, like we start performing those transits, like more than a person who doesn't know their transit, perhaps. Right. Know? Well, right. Because the things that are unconscious to you run your life and you don't know about it. But once you become conscious of anything, you immediately have a new sense of agency over that part of your life because as soon as you're aware of it you can make choices but before you're not aware you can't which again is another reason why i'm really into astrology in general because it's a way to become aware of yeah. yourself well it makes me think of my students when i taught them color theory and i was like okay your chart is like the uh, a certain color of your aura or, or what have you once they learned their colors of their aura, they started performing the colors of their aura. So they, they would come in all dressed to their chart and like they'd be popping and stuff like that. And it's like, it's like that informed performance, like really enhanced their identity. Like, it, like it, it'd be like, once we know that we have a certain gender that we like on us, then we like start really like leaning into that gender. Like I bet maybe yeah. nowadays you lean more into maleness and like wear like little fedoras and like, like really like, Perform. I mean, do you perform maleness more now that you like really identify with maleness? I mean, I think there's I, there's other factors that make that not totally true. Like, I was literally a drag king for a couple decades, so I, I would say I was probably performing maleness more then. Oh, um, okay. Also, because I'm older and I'm single and not dating, and I live in a van down by the river. I don't perform anything. I don't give a, I'm like a happy little mystic sitting in my hammock doing whatever. And I don't care how I look. So not um, really, but like point taken. <laughs> well, like, okay. Like, like it's interesting though that, 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 you know, that it makes me think of performativity and like rising to the occasion. It's like, we might need to, if we are going to be performing our gender or our chart, like we want, might want to give ourselves context that are performative in nature 
that yes. make us rise to that occasion and do the performance of you know gender or astrologer or what have you you know yeah absolutely context yeah. is so much about expression and identity i mean don't you think i mean that keeps coming up in teleology and like everything yes. is like the context leads performance and expression actually yeah i mean actually and and if i'm not mistaken i feel like that's a big idea in postmodernism that context sort of determines things and there's a way that i agree with that you know i think context is really important but again it goes back to this idea of the missing piece is the relationality part it's very it's this very like pure intellectual masculine sort of me focused way of thinking to 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 interact with the concept of meaning arising in context and have your interpretation of that be, oh, well, that just means I get to say whatever I want. And it's like, okay, well, no, like context is created relationally, you know? So like there, there's this other part of it, which, you know, is one of my big critiques of this stuff is like, is it's not just, I mean, what you feel about yourself is important but it's not the only factor like we are creating shared reality together and i believe in the teleology of yourself and and like becoming the you know the form that you are meant to be but that doesn't exist in a vacuum mm -hmm. we are a part of the collective and we have gifts to give to the collective and I don't think that anybody is doing themselves or the collective justice when they try to kind of like wriggle out of what that is. Like, I, I, I feel like, and, well, and again, that is, so, oh, yeah, well, there's the question of like, is Talos, like the expression of self intrinsic or extrinsic or both? And it's like, I think, you know, you're talking about like, we have this intrinsic Talos, like I see myself as a man or woman, I see myself as X, Y, Z. And then we start interacting ex externally and we're like, oh, this per I said I was a, a welder and this person's like, well, you don't weld. And I was like, oh, so I got this external like influence back and I was like, but I could be a welder. Like, and if, if my intrinsically I am a welder, then I will start taking welding classes and I will become a welder no matter what is, like dancing at, at me. Now there are right. some charts that are super relational, like, and part of gender as a performance is that it is relative. Like you and a partner perform gender. Like when you, you know, get with, and that's very Libra to me. It's like some people's gender is Libra, which means it depends on what their partner wants them to be. Like if their partner's <laughs> like, I love when you're a dude or I love when you're doodly, then they, they beef up their masculinity. And if their partner's yes. like, I like when you're more femme, then they like, beef up their femininity and like I think there are relational people who take gender as a relation absolutely and uh, the thing though is the whole spectrum exists as far as an individual's orient orientation towards relationality and one of the possible ways to orient towards relationality is to reject it that is a one thing however that doesn't make the collective stop existing in the fact that human beings on the whole as a species survive by interacting with each other and you know there's room in the system for people who don't want to interact with other people very much you know and there are there's room in the system for people who want to rebel against norms and speaking of which going back to like queer and trans people there's good uh and really interesting research from biologists that suggests that trans and queer people evolve and emerge in larger numbers during parts of human history when we are stable enough to have our survival and reproductive needs covered enough that we can start to move into higher levels of what we need for survival. And we can start including things like art and music in our need for survival and theory and, and writing and ideas and being weird and like, and, and, you know, trans and queer people are absolutely sacred, intentional parts of the human family. Like, I don't want that erased, you know, like the, the, the disruption that we bring is a healthy part of our system. And I would like to see that honored, you know, nice. 
Well, this is probably a good um, place to stop for today. But I, I well, can we talk yeah. guests, for example? Do you, we can can we have guests on the show? Sure. Yeah. Okay. We'll start thinking this week about some guests. I have a few ideas of people, um, but you know more um, like probably queer people than I do at this juncture in my career. Um, but yeah, it, they don't have to be trans people. Well, you're think anyone who has an invested interest. I mean, you're in Portland. I think you just go outside and throw a rock or something. Oh, okay, maybe not a rock, but I spend most of my off. time on the computer, honestly. Um, but yeah. Okay. Let's, we should think yeah. about who wants to talk about these issues. Sure. Um, it makes me think of River Culver, who is a really, you know, River. Oh, yeah. Yeah, River oh, would yeah. be an amazing guest. Yeah, um, he's brilliant. Yeah, yeah he, and he's a sidereolist, so we could also, like, yeah. him about sidereolism. I mean, uh, you know I am, too, but I, I, I switch. Oh, really? You're a switch? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. I mean, I could, there's a whole talk on that. I think the, the tropical zodiac is its own thing and it has valid points. And I, I also, I do both, but okay. that's, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, um, this has been a great conversation. I know we didn't get yes. to the chart of this woman, um, but it's I, okay. <laughs> but it was, it was a great talk. And I thank you great. so much for your time. Yes, absolutely. See you right. next week. All right. Bye, Jael. Bye.